So we have two foundational scriptures that we're going to read starting off this sermonic journey. We're going to read these two foundational texts, and then later on in the message, we're going to exegete them, okay? So we're going to start first in Genesis. Should not be hard for you to find this. Genesis chapter 1. If it is, it's okay. We'll disciple you. No judgment. Genesis chapter 1 is the first book of the Bible, first chapter of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to launch our reading at verses 26 and 27, and then we're going to hop all the way to Proverbs chapter 25 and read verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, and Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. If you do not have a tangible Bible, it is okay. It will be projected for you on the screen. And everybody online, we will have a display for you on the lower thirds. I'm just going to read these foundational texts, and then we're going to break them down later. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you got it, would you yell at your boy, I got it. It says, then God said, let us make man, speaking of mankind, humanity, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion. Somebody say, I have dominion. I have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, which is mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female. Somebody say there is a difference. There is a difference. Male and female, he created them. Now, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28, it says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. To tag a title for the conclusion of our stress management series, I want to speak around this thought from this subject for the time that we have together on this afternoon. Protect your spirit. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit, not your neighbor's spirit, not your mama's spirit, not your baby daddy's spirit. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Protect your spirit. God, you're awesome. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment where we get to come together, where we get to gather and dissect and feast on your word. The worship has gone forth, which is simply us saying, God, this is your ministry. This is your moment. This is your time. They did not come to hear me. We came to hear a rhema. We came to hear a word from God. And I pray that you anoint my lips to be the soundtrack, the PA system of heaven. All the study means absolutely nothing if I'm seen, but you're not. I pray that you're magnified, that you're glorified, and use me in this moment so that you could touch and penetrate the spirit of your people in Jesus' name. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there are a plethora, several scriptures that we are going to navigate through, dissect, and exegete throughout this sermonic journey as we conclude this stress management series. But before we do that, I have a disclaimer. This word on this afternoon is dangerous. <laughs> this particular word is dangerous because this word is going to increase and activate your spiritual awareness. See, a lot of us in the house and watching online, you are frustrated because you are not producing the results that you desire to produce. And the reason that you're frustrated and stressed is because you're trying to achieve them from the wrong level. 
You're trying to achieve it from the wrong level. You're trying to break free from it from the wrong level. You're trying to overcome it from the wrong level. You're trying to dismantle the stronghold from the wrong level. You're fighting from the wrong level. You're fighting from the level of your body. That, that's your hands and your feet and your, your limbs. You're trying to fight it from the level of your body. But if we could ever become people who know how to fight in the spirit. I feel this and I've only been up here about five minutes. If we could ever become people who learn how to fight in the spirit. If we could ever become people who learn how to worship from the spirit. Jesus put it this way. The father is seeking true worshipers who know how to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now for you to worship, you have to understand this. The first time the word worship is mentioned in the scriptures is Genesis 22. And it had nothing to do with the song. It had nothing to do with praise and worship or worship pastor or worship leader or Maverick City song. It had nothing to do with that. The context of worship in Genesis 22 was Abraham about to sacrifice his son. God was testing him. The context and where we first see worship in the scriptures is when Abraham says, me and the lad are going here to worship. He's saying we are going here to sacrifice. So how do you worship from the spirit? It's when you live a life of sacrificing your will for God's will. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's not just a clap. It's not just a hallelujah. It's not just an amen. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. For you to worship in spirit means I worship him by sacrificing my will. If we could become people who know how to worship in the spirit, if we could become people who know how to cry in the spirit, Maybe then we'll start seeing the results that we desire to see. Maybe you're stressed because you're doing the right thing from the wrong level. <laughs> you're doing the right thing from the wrong level. As a parent, specifically a father, if you place my children in a crowd and they begin to cry, I will be able to discern the cry of my daughter and the cry of my son from everybody else's cry. Why? Because I am their father. Stay with me. I am their father. Now, if we go in the store and I hear other children crying, I don't just have the ability to discern why and who my children, why my children are crying. I also know this is my child and they're the one crying. Somebody else's baby, I don't know why they're crying. I mean, they sound like they're getting killed. I go over to the next aisle to see what's going on. It's just her mama telling her toddler, no, you can't have that juice. Put that back. But two aisles over, it sounded like this child was going through it. And we go through the store. I constantly hear children cry, but my response to them is different because they are not my children. I want you to get this. When you become a son of the king, when you become a daughter of the king, God responds to you differently. God comes to your aid differently. God interacts with you differently because you are his child. Maybe the reason we're crying and nothing has happened because you're not his. Responds differently to his children. In fact, I don't just know if it's my daughter or my son. I'm able to discern what cry means what. Because until our emotions develop, the main way children communicate is through a cry. When my children were a little younger and my daughter started crying, I knew that means she's hungry. When my son began to cry and it was more of a fussy, whiny cry, I knew he was sleepy because a good parent, emphasis on good, a good parent can dissect different cries. Still to this day, when my children are upstairs playing and my niece comes over and I hear one of them cry, but it's not a cry to come get daddy's attention. It's just a cry that lets me know, Jerry, your son is playing too rough. 
And as I walk upstairs, before I even see the children, all I hear is, sorry, daddy. (laughs) If you don't believe the sinful nature is real, you don't have children. (laughs) Sorry, daddy. I I could discern the cry. But church family, there is a cry that will cause for me to stop in my tracks. There's a cry. It doesn't matter if I was laying down. It doesn't matter if I was sitting down. It doesn't matter if I'm on the phone. It doesn't matter if I'm reading, if I'm working on a sermon. There was a cry that everything in the whole house stops. And that is the cry when something hurt. Any parents know what I'm talking about? That cry is a little different. And I've noticed this church family. When that cry happens, I swiftly run to my child only to discover they're also running to me. Now it makes sense why Jesus says, unless we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. What has happened to us to where when we experience pain, we're running to bars, we're running to the hookah lounge, we're running to get weed. Y'all don't want to talk to me. We're running to the alcoholic beverage lane. We're running to the weed man. We're running to the relationship instead of running to our heavenly father. This childlike faith is like when something hurts, I'm running to my father. I run to them. I grab them. I said, okay, what happened? Because daddy is here to help you heal. I know that divorce hurt, but I'm going to help you get over that. I know that layoff was unexpected, but I'm going to help you get over that. I know that disappointment kind of hurts you, but I'm going to help you get over that. I know you made some unwise choices, and that's okay. This time, listen to me, because I know how to restore the years that the canker worm has stolen. Come to me. I'm going to help you heal from what you've gone through. I'm going to help you heal from the trauma. I'm going to help you heal from the abuse. But this time, instead of running to them, would you run to me? Run to me because I respond differently to those that are mine. Church, I need us to hear this. This is highly important as we're entering the ninth inning of this calendar year. For this season and for what God is going to do in your life, this time you're going to have to protect your spirit. You're going to have to protect your spirit. I know that you can protect your transportation by locking the doors on your vehicle. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, do you know how to protect your spirit? I know that you can protect your wealth by having a pin code on your debit card or having a pass code on your PayPal, your Vimeo, your Zelly, your Cash App. I know that you can protect those. I'm not talking about that. I want to know, do you know how to protect your spirit? I know that you can protect your phone. Look how thick your phone case is. Some of us have screen protectors, and they're not just screen protectors. They are privacy screen protectors so that the person on your left and the person on your right can't be a peeping Tom as you're scrolling on your idol. I mean, your your phone. As you're scrolling. (laughs) Oops. As you're scrolling on your phone where if God had this much time, you might be holy. If God had as much devotion, did you get that notification today? Your screen time was up 19% this week. Just imagine if we did that with our spirit. I know that you can protect your phone, but that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, do you know how to protect your spirit? Because to not protect the spirit is to invite spiritual graffiti. Did y'all hear what I just said? To not protect your spirit is to invite spiritual graffiti. How much longer are you going to allow people to mark on you? How much longer are you going to allow people to paint on your spirit? How much longer are you going to allow for people to paint and mark on you? Maybe the reason why you're so stressed is is because it's your spirit saying, why do you keep allowing them access to us? I need y'all to help me preach. It's going to get uncomfortable and awkward in here. But could you find two people around you and tell them, it's prophetic for somebody. Could you tell them you're so stressed because you don't protect your spirit? Find two people and tell them you're stressed because you don't protect your spirit. 
And that's why you don't need weed. You need to protect your spirit. You don't need a new man. You need to protect your spirit. You don't need more alcohol. You need to protect your spirit. You don't need gin and juice. You need to protect your spirit. You just don't need pills. You need to protect your spirit. It's prophetic for somebody. You're stressed because your spirit is going unprotected. And it's manifesting in your body as weight gain. It's manifesting in your body as weight loss. It's manifesting in your body as hair loss and bags hanging under your eyes. It's manifesting in every part of your anatomy that your spirit is going unprotected. And you're stressed because I'm not protecting my spirit. And the reason I've been so passionate and sweating each and every week as I'm preaching to you is because I want us to learn to get to the place to rest in the Father's arms. We're stressing because we're not resting. We're not resting in the arms of the Father. I remember my son was whining. All around the house, just fussing. And I was hearing Tanisha saying, okay, Jay, it's time to calm down. Okay, he just fussing and fussing. And I decided to get up to see what's wrong with him. I said, son, come here. Come here. He's mad. He's crying. He's taking his shirt off for no reason. <laughs> like, what you going to do? What you going to do, buddy? What you trying to do? He's mad, taking his shirt off. I said, come here. And I've learned, I really believe that God gives pastor's children just for illustrations, <laughs> just, for, just for messages. So I'm holding him, and as I'm holding him, within about two minutes, I hear him snoring. Look at this picture, y'all. I took a shot of it <laughs> and posted it on social media. This boy was fussing, I think he was around three years old. He just came out of terrific twos. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody caught that. We speak life here. He was coming out of terrific twos, and, and he was just fussing and fussing. And when I held him, he went to sleep. And in that moment, I felt my heavenly Father speak to me. You're fussing. You're stressing, and you're worried because you're not coming to me and allowing me to console you and so many people are internally frustrated and all God is saying is would you let me hold you now if you look at my face my face is saying look at this boy (laughs) and I believe God is looking at some of us like that like why don't you just give it to me why don't you just let me handle it Why, why don't we talk about it Because I am the one that is going to help you de-stress by finding rest in me. I need us to speak this over our lives. And I want everybody watching this to put this in the room in all caps. And everybody, I need us to say this as loud as you can. Can I get us to say this time? I want us to say it loud. This time, time, at all cost, cost, I must must protect my spirit. Their chaos chaos. does not have to be my curriculum. curriculum. Protect my spirit. spirit. Again, this time, time, at all cost, cost. I must must protect my spirit. spirit. Their chaos chaos. does not not have to be my curriculum. curriculum. Protect your spirit. Fist bump two people around you and tell them, protect your spirit. Protect your spirit, protect your spirit, protect your spirit. Not just your phone, but your spirit. Your phone, protect your spirit. Culture used to teach us to wear protection. That only limits you from possibly catching sexually transmitted diseases. But what about spiritually transmitted devils? Protect your spirit. One more time, say protect your spirit. As we have reached the conclusion, the finale, the ninth inning of this amazing stress management series, a series that has been designed and orchestrated by God 
to get us to understand that a calm mind is the secretary for discernment. They work together. Stress robs you of the calm. But a calm mind is the secretary for discernment. And there is a blessing somewhere in every problem we face. How can you say that? It's because we learned over the last eight weeks that stress declares war on what you believe. And I choose to believe what Romans tells me when it tell, tells me that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called by his name so that means that there's a blessing somewhere in every problem I face stress does not have to be my disposition being burned out does not have to be my disposition being overwhelmed does not have to be my disposition having anxiety and anxiety attacks does not have to be my disposition because God wants to deliver us from stress and give us a inward calm we are going to become a people who no longer allow stress to live in our heart as a tenant that is causing our sanity to pay rent <laughs> we will no longer allow stress to live in our heart which is causing for our sanity to pay rent this time we will have an inward calmness I will release the chronic obsession with trying to control outcomes and tomorrow because tomorrow belongs to God. If I was a note taker, I'd write that down. That will help you with your anxiety. Tomorrow belongs to God. The outcome of tomorrow belongs to God. Stop stressing about tomorrow. That belongs to God. Can we go a little deeper? I want to expose the strategy of the enemy. What he wants us to do is to be stressed and worry about tomorrow along with being bound by regrets and wounds from your past so you'll miss all the opportunities that you are given on today one more time hell wants us stressed and worried about tomorrow along with having bondage from regrets and wounds from yesterday so that we will not be able to experience all the opportunities that we have on today. When I'm preaching to you on Sunday, I'm talking about your destiny. When I'm doing therapy Thursday on Thursday, I'm trying to heal you from your history. You need them both because of where you're going and where you've been. The method of the enemy is if I can get you to be stressed over what's coming and still regretting over what was, you'll constantly miss what is. Did y'all hear what I just said? You're stressed over what's coming, not healed from what was, so you're missing the is. This is why you can't enjoy today, because you're stressing over tomorrow and wounded from yesterday, so you're missing your is. This is why you can't value the moments that you have right now. This is why we constantly keep saying things like, I can't wait until, I can't wait until 2023. You've been saying that every New Year's Eve. God is trying to get us. Somebody said, shots fired. <laughs> God is trying to get us to enjoy the is because tomorrow belongs to him. Your past, I can heal you from that. But there's some work that you have to do in your present. Maybe the reason you're stressed is because your spirit is going unprotected. Can we break this down even more? In our foundational text, Genesis chapter 1, I have to go into teacher mode now. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when the text tells us, Then God said, let us make man in our. Let us make man in our. Let us. Who is us and who is our? There is a us and there is an hour. This is irrefutable evidence of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The triune Godhead. Let us make man 
in our image and our likeness. So God has a three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three, but all one. Okay? So now, if man is made in the image and in the likeness of God, and God is three and one, this means man is also three and one. So there's this chart I want us to see. What is our three? We are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. Okay? Because you're made in his image, and you're made in his likeness, you also have a three in one. Your body is the part of you that has a world consciousness. It's the part of you that your flesh is aware of what's going on around you. If you're cold, you'll wear a jacket. If something's loud, you'll cover your ears. If you're hungry, you'll feed your body. If it's raining, you'll have an umbrella. You are aware of everything in your body, everything around your body and your flesh. That's your body. Now, the body provides room and board for your soul and for your spirit. You can't see my soul right now, nor can you see my spirit. Just like looking around, you can't see somebody's soul or spirit. What you see is their body. Now, if you study the text, many times this word soul and spirit are not always synonymous. I'm going to prove it to you. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. We'll put the chart back on in a second. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of what's that word? Soul. And what's that word? Spirit. And of joint and marrow. And is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. So let's put the chart back up. Let's put the chart back up. The text is saying, okay, the word of God many times can cause a division between the soul and the spirit. What is the soul? I tried to get us to understand the Greek word for soul is psyche. It's where we get the word psychology. So your soul is the part of you that houses your mind, your will, your emotions, your imaginations, and your desires. That's your soul. But what is your spirit? Your spirit is the only part of you that can connect to God. This is the part of you that has awareness of what is going on in the spirit. Your body won't be able to fully tell what is going on if, in the spirit if your spirit man is dead. Okay? So your spirit is the router, if you will, to God. Your spirit is the ethernet cord to God. This is how you download revelation. See, as I was studying this week, my spirit had an ethernet cord connected to God, asking him to download revelation in me so that I could upload it to my soul. And then when I preach to you, it can manifest from my body. Does this make a sense? So your, your spirit, man, is the part of you. It's the only part that can connect to God. Without Jesus... We have a body and a soul, but are spiritually dead. Dead. We could be sitting next to right now a dead man. Body alive, soul functional, spirit dead. Have you ever noticed how Jesus referred to the prodigal son? Look, I want y'all to see this because you probably just totally missed it. Luke chapter 15, verse 21, this is the prodigal son story, but I want to show you something. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's repentance. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe 
and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted cat and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. But if you listen to the parable that Jesus gave, this dude never experienced physical death. But look how Jesus is referring to him. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they begin to celebrate. Now, for all of my thinkers, if you are reading this, you caught the part where it says alive. My, my, my son was dead, but is alive again. You can't be alive again if you didn't used to be alive but then you died so what is he saying i'm glad you asked i want to give it to you first corinthians chapter 5 first corinthians chapter 15 excuse me verse 22 it says for as in adam all died (laughs) this is so good y'all i love when the bible connects in adam all died So in Christ, all will be made alive. Are y'all catching this? It is the law of representation. We see this all throughout the Bible. Adam represented all of us. All of us. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave. If we accept him, he represents all of us. The reason cuffing season is going to hit different is because even marriage is the law of representation. It's not about romance. It's about the church in Christ. Are you thinking about representing that before you say they're cute? The law of representation. So really, can I go a little deeper? There are 8 billion plus people in the world. When God looks at the world, he really only sees two. First, Adam our second Adam. You're either dead or you're alive. That's it. You're either dead or you're alive. Now this lifts off condemnation because if the enemy tries to remind you of what you've done, you can say that is dead because I'm a new creature in Christ. My life is hid in Christ. So it's not by works that any man can boast. We're saved by grace through faith. So when we stand before God, he sees the blood of Jesus. So when we come before him, we're either coming before him as a blood-covered son or as an object of wrath. That's it. That's it. Your, Your spirit and your, let's put the chart back up, your spirit and your soul. Now, why does the text say they, they have like a division going on? It's because the Holy Spirit is telling your spirit man, the things that have been downloaded in your spirit, obey that. But your mind and your will have been discipling your body for so long that you don't will to do what the spirit wills. And so a lot of times you're stressed because literally you are walking around containing world war me and your soul and your spirit are fighting one another because the word of God many times can divide soul from spirit. Your spirit wants to do a thing, but your head wants to do another thing. Your will wants to do a thing, but the Holy Spirit's will wants to do another thing. Could you be stressed because each part of your body all are in disagreement. The goal in how we get peace is when our spirit wills to do God's will. And what we have downloaded, we upload in our soul, and now we carry it out in our body. Is this making sense? This is why many of us are stressed. So when the Proverbs tell us a man who does not know how to control A man who does not know how to rule his own spirit is like a broken city whose walls are broken down. It's because everything in your life has access to your spirit. Everything. You're not protecting it because most of this content for many of us has been untaught and we haven't developed spiritual awareness. 
Church family, for what God is about to do in your life for this next season, you can't afford to lease your ear to wrong conversations, to foolishness, and to gossip. This time, you're going to have to learn how to protect your spirit. Whoever's battling with lust and you wonder why your flesh is on one, it's because of your playlist. Your playlist is strengthening the spirit of lust. And you are in church wondering, why am I so lustful? It's because before you ever came to Christ, there are a lot of things that you have done with your body. And there are a lot of things that you keep pumping in your soul. And now your spirit is being hit by everything that you are filtering in because your spirit is unprotected. This time, church family, I need us to protect our spirit. You're going to get a lot of invitations over the next few weeks about holiday gatherings and holiday festivities. This time you won't be able to go. You won't be able to go. You felt that the atmosphere was off the last three times you went there. And so this time what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to learn to protect your spirit. Some people are going to misjudge you when you operate with this because you're going to say no more. No, I'm not going to the gathering. No, you can't come over. No, you can't have my number. No, don't add me back to the group text. You being different. No, I learned how to protect my spirit. There are certain shows I can't watch. It has nothing to do with legalism. It's me protecting my spirit. There are certain things I can't entertain. It has nothing to do with legalism. It's because I'm protecting my spirit. Ooh, it's about to get real in here. Ooh, Lord. See? Are y'all ready for this? All right. The reason all of your relationships ended the same... Is because, yes, the names changed, but they all had the same spirit. Lion spirit, narcissist spirit, drunkenness spirit, manipulating spirit, lustful spirit, abuseful spirit. And don't amen too much because something in your spirit liked it. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Something in your spirit liked it. So when we pray, God, purge me on the inside. Clean me with hyssop. It's because even in my spirit, I'm attracted to stuff that's deadly. Can I come for your edges a little more? The reason why you're hurting so much is because you've been testing bodies but not spirits. Talk Holy Ghost. You see fine, but you're not testing spirit. You see curvy, but you're not testing spirit. You see beers, but you're not testing spirits. You've been testing bodies. (laughs) I need to go on sabbatical again. This fire is a little different today. You've been testing bodies. But you haven't been testing spirits. First John chapter four, verse one tells us to test the spirit. Look at this so you can see I'm not a pure just lying. First John chapter four, verse one says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God for many. Somebody say many. Now say that means a lot. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, in the New King James Version, it says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test some things. Test a few things. What does your Bible say? Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. I want to read that exact same verse from the Message Bible. It says, don't suppress the spirit. This is the Holy Spirit trying to talk to us, which is why your spirit is capitalized. Don't suppress the spirit and don't stifle those who have a word from the master. So your accountability partners right now, me, don't stifle with those who have a word from the master. On the other hand, don't be gullible. (laughs) Check out everything and keep only what is good. 
throw away and throw out anything tainted with evil. I'm trying to get us to understand if you're going to protect your spirit, you have to arrive to a place of unavailability. I'm unavailable to carnality. I'm unavailable to toxicity. I'm unavailable to dysfunction. I'm unavailable to wasting my time. No, this isn't legalism. This is me protecting my spirit. Before you go in business with them, first test the spirit. Before you join that church, I don't care how popular the pastor is. We just read the text says many false prophets exist in the world. Before you join that church, you need to test the spirit. Before you marry them, why are we talking about this? <clears throat> Before you get in covenant, test the spirit. I think it's a scary thing to be in marriage and recognize all you looked at was the body. Let's put the chart back up. <laughs> all you looked at was the body and you like how they talk to your mind, but you never examine their spirit. See how those, those claps are getting softer? <laughs> P- protect your spirit. We're stressed because the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to stop being attracted to wrong spirits. <laughs> but there's something in us that likes those spirits. Now, the thing about discipleship is we're washing and renewing be transformed by the renewing of your mind now remember the 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 soul the psychological part of you the the transformation happens when i start uploading different stuff here is this making sense when i begin to upload stuff in my soul differently that affects my spirit protect your spirit so, so how do we test spirits? I'm glad you asked. I love the Bible because I didn't have to think of how to tell this to you guys. We could just go to Galatians chapter 5. Thank you. And it'll tell us. This, this is how we are going to test the spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. <laughs> it starts so funny. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. <laughs> the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness. Somebody say drunkenness. Because I know that. All right. Drunkenness. Orgies and the like, this is when it gets scary. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why aren't we having pastors telling people the truth? These are the acts of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. So how do you test the Spirit? you looking to see if there's sexual immorality or if there's self-control. You're looking to see, you're looking to see if there's drunkenness or if there's gentleness. This is not judging. This is you fruit inspecting. So good, y'all. It's what the Bible says do. Test the spirit. So I'm testing to see. Now, as we are being born again, accepting Christ and being regenerated, this is why sometimes relationships are unhealthy right now. This is not God withholding something from you. It's I still have to detox from my sexual morality, from my drunkenness, from my envy, from my jealousy. You will get it depending on how often you protect your spirit. 
It got real quiet. And y'all should have heard. When I'm talking about protect your spirit, yet when I tell you how, <laughs> it's all good. I'm not phased by claps. So, so what, is, what is happening? The reason I really, really pray over every series I preach, I do. I don't ever want to just stand before you and preach flesh. I believe this house is a place, and many other churches, that God speaks to vessels. We've talked about king encounters. We've, we've talked about destiny decisions. We talked about exit strategies. We, we talked about what we're currently dealing with on how to be able to not be stressed. Why is God talking to us about this? Because of what he is doing and what he's about to do. I can't give you the blessing you're praying for because you're stressed right now in the present. The position that you have the gift for, your stress is making you act out of character. That's not really you. That's your stress. Just like my children, they cry differently when they're hungry. And you act differently when you're stressed. And so why did God cause us to deal with this for eight weeks? It's because of what he's about to do and what he is currently doing. This is not normal, but you have not been called to be normal. Talk to me, somebody. You have not been called to be normal. This word has been designed to expand you and get you to experience the peace of God for real. I said that week one, fresh off sabbatical. I want you to experience the peace of God for real. You are not called to live normal, ordinary, average life. What we have to stop doing is because when we live normal, we will reject fresh springs and choose polluted wells. Just because everybody drinks there doesn't mean you should drink there and just label it an acquired taste. If you be honest, it actually tastes bitter now. The cigarettes taste bitter now. The porn tastes bitter now. Settling tastes bitter now. Am I talking to anybody? You can try to do it, but once a man meets Jesus, they can never sin the same again. It tastes bitter because I'm trying to get you to be conditioned for another level. Hell can't stand when we mature. Can't st this type of teaching helps you actually be a Christian. I'm tired of people complaining about not receiving the blessings the Bible speaks about. I'm like, are we the Christ followers the Bible speaks about? Hell loves if you stay immature. See, I don't think it's a coincidence that the devil is referred to as this old serpent. I was watching this, this thing on Animal Planet. It was talking about this, this snake. Snakes like eggs. Y'all didn't get it. That old serpent doesn't want us to mature and snakes like eggs. This one particular snake likes eagle eggs and it will climb all the way up this tree. I'm serious. You should research it. Climb all the way up the tree and try to consume the egg before it hatches. Try to consume the egg before it breaks through. Try to consume the egg before it becomes. Why? Because eagles eat snakes. <laughs> I hope y'all are getting this. This is so powerful. Eagles eat snakes. They will take a snake and they don't fight them on the ground. They take them to a whole nother realm so that the snake loses its balance. And then the eagle will take his claws and shred up the snake and then feed it to his babies. I don't want you to become something that could devour me. And I recognize this back in 2015 and I've never been the same. Hell wants you to think that you have too many problems when truth is you're going to cause hell too many problems. Never wants us mature. Never wants us to reach a place of maturity. For all worshipers, which is all of us in the house, for all worshipers, the enemy tries to assign to you the spirit of fear because I want to muzzle your mouth. I don't want you to, uh, I don't want you to lift praise. I don't want you to worship, especially when you are anointed because anointing breaks yokes. 
for all worshipers hell specifically assigns to you the spirit of heaviness I want you to feel too heavy to lift your hands. I want you to feel so downcast in your soul where you don't want to pray because it's a sign to you the spirit of heaviness. Hell tries to break you before you can break free and break others. There are chains on others that you're going to break. And so he tries to assign to you. I'm talking, y'all, the spirit of heaviness. It's on your mama. It's been on your daddy. It's been on your aunties. This is why on Thanksgiving, just notice how you leave the house heavy. Not just depression. I'm not minimizing clinical depression. But notice after the conversations, you feel heavy. It's not just what happened. It's a spirit. A spirit of heaviness. And Jesus... It's so amazing. So amazing. Luke chapter 4. We're about to end. I want y'all to see this. Luke chapter 4. This had me like, I called my mom. I said, Ma, listen, did you know this? Luke chapter 4. I want y'all to see this episode when Jesus comes in church. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue or went to church on the Sabbath. And stood up to read. And when he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to recover And recovery of sight to the blind. To set and liberate those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Look how cold this is, y'all. Then he closed the book. Gave it back to the attendant. (laughs) Sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the church were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Boss moves. See, right now, when I preach, I'm giving you a word. But when Jesus preached, the word is preaching the word. (laughs) Y'all missed it. Jesus walks up. See, we have chapters and books and, 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 and like verses and stuff. It was just like a long scroll. They hand the book. He reads it. And he's like, okay, everything this said. I am. (laughs) Set out. Church over. Where my music at? Church done. Like I wonder when we get to heaven one day and we have church service, Jesus just walk up and say, I I am. Amen. That's it. (laughs) I don't need to say nothing else. Church over. (laughs) But I began to do a little research. I said, okay, where in Isaiah was that? And I started to dig in my Bible. Because this is what I do for a living. I try to dissect the word of God, give it to you so that we could grow together. Okay? So Isaiah 61 is where he was reading from. Isaiah 61, verse 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me, because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. See, the Old Testament was already prophesying about Jesus. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prisons to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil for joy for mourning. The garment of praise. Uh Uh-oh. For the spirit of heaviness. Hmm. Okay. What's the revelation, God? Okay. Jesus walked up and said, okay, everybody who's heavy, everybody who needs to be set free, everybody who's dealing with issues, everybody who has a spirit of heaviness, I can fix that. (laughs) And sat down. So as I was looking at this, I said, oh, my God. Jesus was telling everybody, 
the, re- the solution to your heaviness is your praising of me. What is the garment? My blood. My blood should activate a praise on the inside of you and that praise should shake off the spirit of heaviness. Now worship is thanking God for who he is, but praise is thanking God for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. Just in case there's somebody heavy in the sanctuary, I think right now is an appropriate time for us to put on the garment of praise and give God a praise in the house. Praise him for what he's done. Praise him for what he's going to do. Praise him like you already got it. Praise him like you're going to break through it. Because this is the solution to getting over your stress. This is the solution for getting over your depression. It's your praise. It's not in weed. It's not in alcohol. It's not in sex. It's in Jesus. This is what freedom sounds like. This is what revival sounds like. This is what overcoming sounds like. This is what a breakthrough sounds like. If somebody sitting next to you doesn't understand it, it's okay. Your praise can break their chains. You're sitting next to somebody who's going to cause you to be set free. I could be your locksmith and you don't even know it. Praise is for the spirit of heaviness. God, I thank you that you're wonderful. I thank you that you're awesome. I thank you that you didn't throw me away. I'm thankful that you saw me as worth dying for. I'm thankful that you're the God of chance after chance. Praise is what I do when I feel heavy. Whatever you're looking for, I am. The freedom is in me. Y'all sit down, you're rushing me. It's four points and I'm done. How do we protect our spirit? You have to establish a hedge. You have to establish a hedge. A hedge in biblical times was a fence that was around grapes and vineyards. Y'all remember that old school song, Jesus be a fence? Y'all remember that? We don't have time for it. We don't have time. But a hedge is designed to make sure that foxes don't get your fruit. Beware of the foxes that spoil the vine. Hedge is a fence. It is boundaries. Now, how do we do that? Number one, by prayer. You can't protect your spirit and not pray. Because your spirit is, the spirit is the ethernet cord to God. You don't know what you just blocked when you just prayed. Okay? Number one, somebody say prayer. Prayer. Number two, how do you protect your spirit? Leadership. Leadership, that is those and are those people around you to educate you in the areas that you have been untaught. Okay, that's it. It's not nothing deep. It's not slavery. It's just God has given you leaders to help you learn and unlearn so that you can learn how to protect your spirit. Number three, how do I protect my spirit? Community. You're easier to hit when you're alone. If we go hunting, I'm aiming for the one that's by themselves. Many members of one body. Forsake not the fellowship of the saints. And you have to be careful because every saint ain't. (laughs) That's the sermon series. Go back and listen to that. I don't have time. And last point. This is the most difficult. The the way we protect the spirit is by intentionally detoxing what the flesh loves. Intentionally. Now, as we ended our fast, I don't know how you are, but 
I've discovered it, it's not that Jerry is disciplined. When we fast, it's not that I'm just so disciplined and I won't do it. I need it out the house. Anybody else like that? Like when you fast, throw it away. Oreos, throw away. We're going to eat. I'm not going. You have to deliberately detox what was feeding your body and what was feeding your soul things that cause division with the spirit and the Holy Spirit. That could be your playlist. That could be social media. That could be your subscriptions. A lot of us need to unsubscribe to a lot of stuff. Your OnlyFans page, I'm talking. There are a lot of stuff that we need to delete and unsubscribe because you want to have meetings with us wondering why I'm struggling. And I'll say, point four, deliberately detox from anything the flesh loves. You will always thirst for what you are. You will always thirst for what you are. And you will always click with clicks that have similar diets. You're lustful. The dude you like will be just as lustful as you. You'll always click with whatever your spirit clicks with. I need a detox from that.